Tonight is the final night before Jesus' crucifixion. On this night, Jesus was betrayed. He told them that his body and blood would be given for them. This is the night where Jesus washed the disciples' feet and told them to do the same. And then he had his last meal with them and told them to keep celebrating his meal so that they would never forget what was about to happen. Never doubt the reality of Jesus' journey to the cross. It happened a long time ago, but it happened. Jesus gave his body and blood for us. His death terrifies us because it reveals how committed the world is to its own way and the price the world exacts from those whose commitment is to Jesus. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, what we contemplate this night is beyond words, beyond understanding. May the Holy Spirit intercede for us and give voice to what for us is impossible. Amen. of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God 
and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Our first reading tonight is Exodus chapter 24, verses 3 through 11. Then Moses went down to the people and repeated all the instructions and regulations the Lord had given him. All the people answered with one voice, We will do everything the Lord has commanded. Then Moses carefully wrote down all the Lord's instructions. Early the next morning, Moses got up and built an altar at the foot of the mountain. He also set up 12 pillars, one for each of the 12 tribes of Israel. Then he sent some of the young Israelite men to present burnt offerings and to sacrifice bulls as peace offerings to the Lord. Moses drained half the blood from these animals into basins. The other half he splattered against the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it aloud to the people. Again, they all responded, We will do everything the Lord has commanded. We will obey. Then Moses took the blood from the basins and, basin and splattered it over the people, declaring, Look, this blood confirms the covenant the Lord made with you in giving you these instructions. Then Moses, Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, and the 70 elders of Israel climbed up the mountain. There they saw the God of Israel. Under his feet there seemed to be a surface of brilliant blue lapis lazuli, as clear as the sky itself. And though these nobles of Israel gazed upon God, he did not destroy them. In fact, they ate a covenant meal, eating and drinking in his presence. The second reading is Hebrews 9, verses 11 to 22. Christ is the perfect sacrifice. So Christ has now become the high priest over all the good things that have come. He has entered that greater, more perfect tabernacle in heaven, which was not made by human hands and is not part of this created world. With his own blood, not the blood of goats and calves, he entered the most holy place once for all and secured our redemption forever. Under the old system, the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer could cleanse people's bodies from ceremonial impurity. Just think how much more the blood of Christ will purify our consciences from sinful deeds so that we can worship the living God. For by the power of the eternal spirit, Christ offered himself to God as a perfect sacrifice for our sins. That is why he is the one who mediates a new covenant between God and people, so that all who are called can receive the eternal inheritance God has promised them. For Christ died to set them free from the penalty of the sins they had committed under that first covenant. Now, when someone leaves a will, it's necessary to prove that the person who made it is dead. The will goes into effect only after the person's death. While the person who made it is still alive, the will cannot be put into effect. That is why even the first covenant was put into effect with the blood of an animal. For after Moses had read each of God's commandments to all the people, he took the blood of calves and goats along with water and sprinkled both the book of God's law and all the people using hyssop branches in scarlet wool. Then he said, This blood confirms the covenant God has made with you. In the same way, he sprinkled blood on the tabernacle and on everything used for worship. In fact, according to the law of Moses, nearly everything was purified with blood. For without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. The Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 26, verses 19 through 30. Glory to Christ our Savior. 
Interspersed in our gospel readings today, we will be singing verses from Jesus, Lamb of God. So the disciples did as Jesus told them, and prepared the Passover meal there. When it was evening, Jesus sat down at the table with the twelve. While they were eating, he said, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. Greatly distressed, each one asked in turn, Am I the one, Lord? He replied, One of you who has just eaten from this bowl with me will betray me. For the Son of Man must die, as the scriptures declared long ago. But how terrible it will be for the one who betrays him. It would be far better for that man if he had never been born. Judas, the one who would betray him, also asked, Rabbi, am I the one? And Jesus told him, You have said it. As they were eating, Jesus took some bread and blessed it. Then he broke it in in pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. He gave it to them and said, Each of you drink from it, for this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. Mark my words, I will not drink wine again until the day I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Then they sang a hymn and went out to the Mount of Olives. Our sermon today is going to be a little different than usual. And the reason for that is because I'm going to be preaching a catechetical sermon. And now you might think, Pastor Roland, stop using your big words. Catechetical, making yourself sound smart. Well, I promise you I'm not that smart. I think I am, but I'm really not. But the word catechetical means basically an instruction or a teaching. That's why we call it catechism. And why we call people who graduate from catechism catechumens. It all comes from that same word, catechetical or catechesis, right? Now, the reason why I've chosen this sermon type, which is an unusual sermon type, is because traditionally speaking, Monday, Thursday, our service here today is focused on the institution of the Lord's Supper of Communion by Jesus on the night before his crucifixion. However, due to the extraordinary circumstances we find ourselves in amidst this COVID-19 pandemic, we are unable to physically meet together as a congregation and partake in the supper together as we usually would. As a result, our church has decided to invite congregants to celebrate communion in their home while watching the service. 
This has led to several important questions about the nature of communion and whether or not such communion is truly valid. So the question we will be exploring today is, what makes communion, communion? When our Lord Jesus Christ instituted communion, he did so with the following words that we just read from the Methean account of the words. But of course they are also recorded in Mark and Luke and 1 Corinthians as well. And for the sake of clarity, I will once again repeat the verses found in Matthew 26, verses 26 through 28. As they were eating, Jesus took some bread and blessed it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take this and eat it, for this is my body. And he took a cup of wine and gave thanks to God for it. He gave it to them and said, Each of you drink from it, for this is my blood, which confirms the covenant between God and his people. It is poured out as a sacrifice to forgive the sins of many. In theology, we call these words that I have just spoken the words of institution. An important point that we're going to be returning to in a moment. However, in order to understand what makes communion communion, we must first understand what communion is. Now, for those of you who took confirmation, you will remember these words from Luther's small catechism, which state that we believe, teach, and confess that Holy Communion is the true body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ under the bread and wine instituted by Christ himself for us Christians to eat and drink. Along with the historic Christian faith, we believe that our Lord Jesus is truly present both bodily and spiritually in communion, just as his word said he would be. Of what benefit is this to you, you might ask? Well, to answer that, I once again turn to the words of Luther in the Catechism, where he says, These words, given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins, show us that in the sacrament forgiveness of sins, life and salvation are given us through these words. For where there is forgiveness of sins, there is also life and salvation. We believe that those who partake in communion, a means of grace, to use a technical term, do indeed receive forgiveness of sins, just as Jesus said. But how can merely eating the elements of communion possibly result in such a great benefit? Once again, Luther answers in the following way in his catechism, saying, Certainly not just eating and drinking do these things, but the words written here, given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. These words, along with the bodily eating and drinking, are the main thing in the sacrament. Whoever believes these words has exactly what they say, forgiveness of sins. Thus it is those who believe the words of promise spoken to us during the words of institution who receive the forgiveness. Faith is required to partake in communion worthily and to acquire its benefits. For as the Apostle Paul declares in Romans and Galatians, we are justified by faith apart from works of the law. When faith is not mixed with the words of promise, communion is of no benefit to anyone. But when it is mixed with the words of promise and faith is mixed with it, it is of infinite benefit. Because it dispenses exactly what Jesus said it would. The forgiveness of sins. In the form of the true body and true blood of our Lord Jesus. So in summary, communion is the true body and blood of Jesus. Given for you the forgiveness of sin. And it is received in faith. In a short summary. I will just repeat that once more. Communion is the true body and blood of Jesus given for you for the forgiveness of sin, and it is to be received in faith. Now that we understand what communion is, we can move on to the question of what makes communion communion. And for that discussion, we return back to the words of institution, which Jesus first spoke nearly 2,000 years ago in the upper room with his disciples the night before his crucifixion. 
You see, as Lutherans, we believe that it is the word which makes the sacrament. Whereas Article 7 of the Solid Declaration of the Formula Concord declares, and now just to clarify, that is our Lutheran confessional documents, which is found in the 1580 Book of Concord, which is kind of like the governing theological authority of our church. And it says the following. For the true and almighty words of Jesus Christ, which he spake at the first institution, were efficacious not only at the first supper, but they endure, are valid, operate, and are still efficacious, so that in all places where the supper is celebrated according to the institution of Christ, and his words are used, the body and blood of Christ are truly present, distributed, and received. Because of the power and efficacy of the words which Christ spake at the first supper, for where his institution is observed and his words are spoken over the bread and wine and the consecrated bread and wine are distributed, Christ himself through the spoken words is still efficacious by virtue of the first institution through his word which he wishes to be there repeated. Now you might be thinking, what did you just say, Pastor Roland? <laughs> And now you know what occupies Pastor Gemini's time, <laughs> trying to decipher what that means. But here is what it means in a very simple way. What it's trying to tell us is that it's the words of Jesus which make communion communion, not anything else. It's that simple. Jesus' words make communion communion, not special powers that pastors have because Pastor Jim and I certainly don't have any of those. Kind of wish I did, but I certainly don't. <laughs> it's not a specific location. You don't have to be here at church. It's not about the worthiness or the unworthiness of the person speaking the words of institution. For every time we celebrate communion here, you are having the words of institution spoken by two unworthy people. Only the words of Jesus make the sacrament. And these words are not some sort of incantation, magic words. Of course, everyone's heard the phrase hocus pocus. Well, where does that come from? Well, in Latin, part of the words of institution were hoc est corpus meum. This is the body. And of course, when you're a, a illiterate peasant or you don't know Latin, you think hocus pocus. <laughs> so they think the magic word hocus pocus. But it's not hocus pocus. It's not a magic word. It's the word of Jesus spoken 2,000 years ago that rings across all of eternity and time. When he spoke these words of institution, he spoke them eternally because he said, I desire for you to repeat them. Do this in remembrance of me. And it is our repetition of those words, of Jesus' efficacious, powerful words that make the sacrament the sacrament and nothing else. And because of this, we are still able to celebrate communion as a church. For when the words of institution are spoken, Jesus is truly present bodily and spiritually in the bread and wine for you, just as he promised he would be. So I humbly beg you to treat this time of communion online with the appropriate reverence and respect. Even though you are not at church, Christ is with you and deserves your honor, love, and respect. Do not abuse the precious gift that God has given us. If, however, you are not comfortable doing this, then don't. Because this should only be done with a clear conscience and in good faith. Finally, we are only doing this because of the extreme circumstances related to the COVID-19 pandemic. Ideally, this is not the way communion should be practiced. And as soon as we are able to gather together again, we will discontinue this method. This is for the sake of good order in the church. For you called Pastor Jim and me to serve you as ministers of word and sacrament. 
And so we should, under normal circumstances, be the ones consecrating and dispensing communion. Not because we're special, or because we have some sort of special attributes or magic powers, but because that is what you have called us to do as your pastors. And that is our duty and our privilege to this community and to you. And to Christ, for that matter. As we've solemnly sworn in our ordination vows. So I do hope this has been informative for you. And I eagerly await the day when we can commune together as a community of saints. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we give you thanks that even in these extraordinary times you are present. We give you thanks that we can partake of your body and your blood. For it is by your words alone that the sacrament is made. Help us to be encouraged by this fact in this time. And help us to treat your most blessed sacrament with the respect and honor and joy that it rightfully should induce in us. In Jesus' holy name, amen. amen.
On this night, Jesus knew that he would suffer. Lord, help us to remember. On this night, Jesus knew that he was the Passover lamb. Lord, help us to remember. On this night, Jesus gave thanks. Lord, help us to thank you for our suffering. On this night, Jesus took ordinary bread and said that it was his body. Lord, help us to believe. On this night, Jesus took ordinary wine and said that it was his blood. Lord, help us to believe. On this night, Jesus made a new covenant. Lord, help us to live in it. On this night, Jesus made a new covenant to forgive us and remember our sin no more. Trusting in the new covenant, we confess our sins. We, we confess, confess that, that we, we have sinned against you. you. We, we receive, receive your forgiveness with confidence because of what you have done for us. us. Glory, Glory be to, to the, the Father and to the Son and, and to the Holy Spirit. Spirit. Amen. Amen.
Tonight we're doing something extraordinary because it's, these are extraordinary times in which we find ourselves. We're unable to meet together as a congregation in this place. And while we have communion Monday through Friday, not everyone is able to make it out for that those times because they're self-isolating as they have been told to and indeed should. So as we do this tonight, understand this is not normal, this is not what we'll always do, but this is what we feel called to do at this moment in time. As Pastor Roland explained earlier, communion really is not about so much being in the same physical building as it is most of all about the power of the word, the power of Christ. It's about faith. And I believe it's also about community. That tonight, as the called representative of this congregation, I'll be presiding over communion, which will take place in many different places throughout our city and maybe even beyond. When I lift the elements to institute them, I would invite you to do the same at home, to take your cracker or whatever you have and raise it, and then the wine or juice or what you have at home and raise it. We ask that you wait until the, the distribution starts uh, to actually partake in that so that we're all partaking at roughly the same time. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, in mercy for our fallen world, you gave your only Son, that all those who believe in him should not perish, but have eternal life. We give thanks to you for the salvation you have prepared for us through Jesus Christ. Send now your Holy Spirit into our hearts, that we may receive our Lord with a living faith as he comes to us in his Holy Supper. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink of this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ, Christ has died. died. Christ, Christ has risen. risen. Christ, Christ will come again. again. Together we pray. Our, Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be, be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen.
Christ shall be in the midst of God. Now may the true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord, and unite the wills of those whom you have fed with one heavenly food, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.
Love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my supplications because he inclined his ear to me therefore I will call on him as long as I what shall I return to the Lord for all his bounty to me I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all of his people Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his faithful ones. O Lord, I am your servant. I am your servant, the child of your girl. You have loosed my bonds. I will offer to you a thanksgiving sacrifice. And call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord. In the presence of all of his peoples. In the courts of the house of the Lord. In your midst, O Jerusalem, praise the Lord. Jesus fell on his face and prayed, saying, My Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Thanks be to God that Jesus was obedient unto death. Lord Jesus Christ, tonight we give an offering of thanksgiving. We thank you for your willingness to suffer for us. We, we thank you for your being obedient unto death. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. 